All right. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. It's uh, Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and thanks for wherever it is that you happen to be logging in from. I don't know if we have folks from overseas joining us today, but, you know, thanks for tuning in, and I hope it's a nice, beautiful day wherever you're at. Just as a warning, here in Rochester, New York, uh, they're calling for s uh, severe thunderstorms to be rolling in here in about the next hour and a half. So if for some reason we should cut out during the course of the webinar, we do apologize in advance and just know that it's most likely because of a power outage on your end, not anything having to do with your logging in. So as we were saying, today's uh, the webinar within the series, we're talking about, I think this is about the sixth or the seventh in the series now. And we're looking at building envelopes and moisture control. I'm going to be your presenter for today. My name is Jeremy Linden. I'm a Senior Preservation Environment Specialist here at IPI. And in the background with me in the room, we have Chris Cameron. He's running sort of the background technical information and keeping the webinar going along smoothly. As always, if you have any questions for tech support or any issues logging into the talk, uh, there's some information down below in terms of the number to call in for the conference audio as well as the access code to use. And over on the side, if you need any help otherwise with tech support or getting into the webinar today, you can contact Lauren Parrish at lmppph at rit.edu. Uh, her number, direct extension here at IPI is 585-475-7175. Again, if you have any questions throughout the webinar today, feel free to use the question box. It's going to be part of the... Uh, uh, boy, this is what software we're using. This is code meeting today. It's going to be part of the code webinar software that you're looking at over on the right-hand panel. But, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead and send them in. Chris is going to be fielding those for us, and he'll send those over to me as quickly as possible. Most of the questions that come in we're going to address here at the end of the session today. I'll try to make sure that we leave some spare time at the end to go through as many questions as possible and try to talk about what it is that you guys are wondering. This series, uh, thanks again to the National Endowment for uh, for the Humanities to their Education and Training Grant Program for funding this series for the third time. Uh, as we've said before, there's, there was a series of on-site workshops that we did, two-day workshops at five different locations around the country. And starting in February on up through October of this year, we're going to be working on different webinars that are looking at a variety of different topics, some of which we covered uh, to a small extent within the on within the on-site workshops, others of which are kind of unique to this particular series. So thanks again for joining us. I hope we have some new folks today as well as a whole bunch of people who have joined in with us before. And the webinars in this series are really what we're trying to provide here, what we're trying to get to, is just a better understanding of how we want to balance the need of both preservation for collections, but also when we look at building operation and when we look at sort of the bottom lines of how we keep our organizations and our cultural institutions open and running. We're also looking at sustainability issues and talking about energy consumption. So at the end of the day, what we want to hope to provide are some practical guidelines for managing and reducing the risk to collections that you know could come up as a result of institutions looking at any new energy management practices as they're moving forward with their own sustainability goals. Today's presentation, just as kind of a forewarning, is primarily geared toward historic buildings, historic smaller institutions. Uh, we don't always get to do a lot of work uh, with smaller cultural institutions. A lot of the work in this field or a lot of collections are focused and gathered into larger institutions or larger uh, university settings or private settings. But there are a critical number of smaller institutions, whether it be historical societies, small private institutions spread around the United States and around the world, that hold a significant amount of our cultural heritage, uh, whether it be here in the U.S. or elsewhere. And today is trying to go back and talk a little bit about what it is that you might have to contend with in some of those building structures. Not necessarily from the specifics of the preservation environment or from the specifics of the mechanical systems, which we'll get to next week. But really, today we're looking at a little bit of how it is that the envelope acts as a buffer and how it is that the outdoor environment interacts with the building envelope to, in many ways, influence what it is that we're dealing with out or what we're dealing with indoors. So we're going to go through and talk a little bit about thermal energy today and a little bit about heat, but by and large, we're going to focus an awful lot on moisture. One thing that I would ask that you keep in mind through this is that largely based on our own experience and based on sort of a breadth of, a, breadth of examples, uh, 
we're going to be talking an awful lot from the perspective of buildings that may be sitting in climates and zones that are seeing different seasonal conditions and whether that's hot and humid in the summertime or cold and relatively dry or at least low moisture contents in the wintertime. Uh, we're going to be going through and just talking about buildings that are dealing with those types of situations. If you're working with a smaller institution or an envelope that is located in some other part of the country, a lot of these principles, a lot of these ideas will still hold true. That being said, I think in several cases, maybe how it is that they play out or how you might want to apply them would have to be thought about a little bit differently. So please do feel free to ask questions about that when we get to the question period. If you if there's something that we've talked about that you think there's another aspect that has to be covered for your own particular situation, or feel free to ask those questions after the webinar as well. One thing that we want to at least keep in mind as we move through this is that when we're talking about smaller institutions, and you know, from my own personal experience, I oftentimes think about historical societies in this manner, but oftentimes the challenge is that you have to balance the need to maintain the historical integrity of the building itself with the preservation of the collections that are managed uh, therein. And the trick there is that in a lot of these cases, the building may be the largest single object in your collection. And the preservation of such is equally as critical as it is to preserve whatever else it is that you might have inside of it, be it books, papers, records, uh, anything in terms of 3D objects. But in a lot of cases, that building itself, that structure, is your single largest collection item. And as we think about creating interior environments, we have to stay true not only to the historic integrity and aesthetic of the building itself, but we also have to be very careful about its structure and how it is that the envelope will respond to whatever indoor environment we try to create. And we're going to try and touch on that throughout today's talk. And the other thing that comes into play, and I think we all recognize this just from experience for anyone who's worked in smaller institutions, is that there are truly are some unique challenges that we have to deal with and think about when we're managing environments inside of historic structures. You don't often have the same degree or range of flexibility of solutions that you might have in modern buildings or more modern institutions. So today's focus as we go through, we're going to be talking a little bit about building envelopes and how to understand how envelopes behave, what their role is, a little bit of information about classification and just how to think of them in terms of categories. We're going to spend a little bit of time on heat loads, although, as I said, not quite as much. We'll spend the majority of our time looking at moisture and moisture loads. Uh, talking about understanding and how do we diagnose some different problems and risks that may, may occur inside the interior environment of the building. What the consequences might be of different seasonal operation of buildings. I know a lot of us out there are dealing either with seasonal closures of particular structures or just reduced hours during different times of the year. And finally, looking at a few strategies for improvement. And we'll try to go through and talk about those from the very broad and general down to a few more case-by-case uh, -case specifics if we can. And again, do keep in mind that, you know, unfortunately, just because of the uniqueness of every one of these structures, not every one of these discussion points or not every one of these examples may apply to you, but hopefully there's something in here that you can take away for your own institution. So as we look back over at the overview of the series so far, uh, just briefly, back in May we talked about what it is that the outdoor climate uh, has to do with the interior environment within our buildings, how it is that we cope with it, what we have to think about in terms of different climate conditions around the country and around the world. And today we're going to focus on sort of the next level of that, and it's how that outdoor climate and the building envelope interact, and talking about how it is the conditions move across the envelope, whether from the outside in or from the inside out and what it is that that uh, different communication may look like or what it is that we have to contend with. And then next month, when we get in both in August and September, we're going to move in inside the building now and start talking a little bit more about any mechanical systems or how it is that we may contend with or how it is that we might try and mitigate or alleviate some of these environmental conditions that have come through the building envelope that now we have to change or make different for the sake of preservation of collections over time. So first talk, this is you know fairly straightforward, relatively basic, right? What is the building envelope when we talk about this? You know, a couple of minutes, Jim walked in and cracked a joke and said, envelopes, huh? Well, you have the self-stick adhesive kind and the kind that you lick. That's what it comes down to. Well, yeah, that would be a pretty short presentation. But when we're thinking about building envelopes, we understand that really what we're looking at is that outer skin, that physical separation between the interior environment and the exterior environment.
And what this does for us in any circumstance, whether we're talking historic structures or modern structures, this is what's creating that buffer, that resistance to air conditions, moisture moving from one side to the other, any heat energy that might be coming through, light, and different degrees of noise that may make it into the building from outdoors, or in some cases, noise that may occur indoors and making sure it doesn't get, doesn't get out. But as we go down through, the envelope in any structure can take on a lot of different shapes and sizes. We may have chimneys, we have, in any building, we have a roof that we have to contend with. There are aspects of the roof, whether it's a flat roof or a pitched roof. How are we dealing with different eaves? How are we dealing with water drainage off of that roof? What do we have in terms of walls? Is the entire structure above grade? Are we working with a structure that is largely below grade, especially when we start talking about more modern buildings, uh, oftentimes you do run into a lot of subgrade structures where they're being built and designed for sustainability and energy purposes. But what do we have for windows and doors throughout the entire building? Are we talking about an old warehouse structure where there aren't a whole lot of windows present? Or are we talking about what was formerly a residence where there may be a lot of windows and doors, both for egress but also for the sake of letting in ventilation and natural daylight? And is there a Below grade structure to this building? Do we have to worry about walls below grade or floor slabs below grade that are going to be points where air or moisture can permeate through? And how, it is that, how are we going to go about dealing with those? <clears throat> and it's those interactions that we're really critically concerned with here. As we again think from the top down, if you will, you know, in any particular roof structure, we recognize in general, and this isn't rocket science by any means. But we recognize that we have a lot of thermal grade, a lot of thermal gain in hot weather and sunny weather that's going to come through that roof. Or in the winter time, if we're dealing with cooler conditions, we may be dealing with thermal loss, uh, depending on what's going on. As we go down through and look at the rest of the structure, when we're thinking about windows, we have solar radiation coming through the window that's going to create a uh, heat condition inside of the building. We'll talk a little bit about that as we move into this further. But we might also have moisture incursion through the envelope, whether it's, sheerly, whether it's sheerly from the perspective of leakage or whether we're talking about vapor transfer across a surface or across the envelope. We may also have thermal loss or gain, again, going through in and out of a wall, depending on how much insulation is present. And as we get down to the basement again, we're looking at thermal loss either to uh, subgrade conditions, soil conditions below grade, or we may also have moisture gain coming up through the basement of the building. And all of these are aspects that we have to keep in mind, which means that as we look at the structure as a whole, if we think about it holistically, we don't really expect the interior of any particular building to feel exactly the same uh, from top to bottom as any other particular location in, the, in that one unique structure. Now that envelope for us not only moderates the effects of the unconditioned climate from outside, but really the key here is that it has a pretty, pretty significant impact on what the conditions are inside that we can expect to achieve. If we have an older structure, if we're dealing with, uh, let's say, not just an historic house, but maybe even an historic barn, uh, where it's just single sheathing over post or over beam, we don't necessarily expect to be able to hold a heated condition inside of that barn in the wintertime, largely because you'll see a lot of that heat escape to the outdoors. And at the same time, if we have a modern structure that's very well insulated in the walls and very well insulated in the, in the roof, we expect that if we create a certain temperature condition on the indoors, that we should be able to hold that fairly steadily. So every one of these building envelopes that we deal with is going to have slightly different characteristics. What remains true, though, as we move from one structure to another, is that more often than not, we really find that we have two different categories of spaces within a particular building. And we can divide those up pretty well into dealing with a perimeter or sort of the exterior surfaces of a particular building. But as we move in from those exterior walls or from that roof or that basement space, we start to realize that we have this interior portion of the structure that not only is it, shall we say, immediately removed from those exterior structures, but it's also going to oftentimes find a very different environmental condition, both in terms of temperature and relative humidity, because it is removed from that direct uh, outdoor, ex or outdoor uh, wow, sorry about that. It's removed from that direct outdoor influence. So as we go through, we find that the interior may not see as much load in terms of heat and moisture from the outdoors, but what we still have to contend with as we look at those interior spaces, 
is figuring out what's going on in terms of the amount of heat load that we add, either from lights, from office equipment, computer equipment, other electronics that we may be running within that particular space, and also just us as people, how populated is that particular space and what it is that we have to worry about, not only in terms of heat load, but also in terms of moisture load. So the first step for any of us is we start to look at our structures and think about, all right, what do I have to work with? What is it that I have to contend with? Is that we have to be able to look at the building from the outdoors and also from the inside and have an idea of, all right, what is the basic construction here? What should I expect of this particular building that I'm dealing with, that I'm working within? And what can I hope to achieve? Not only is this about how well will that particular envelope mitigate temperature changes from the outside, but how well does that envelope allow for air movement? Is air supposed to pass through the building or is it supposed to be relatively tight? What does it do for moisture control? Do we have vapor barriers up in the walls? Do we expect moisture to move to and fro from the building? The seasons change and moisture content changes. What might, be, what might we be dealing with in terms of vapor pressure from indoors to outdoors in different seasons? And one other thing there just to consider is, you know, looking at it and asking yourself, what is it that we expect to get out of this building? Is the building itself, itself as a structure simply there as a, shall we say, purpose-built building for the idea of storing collections inside of it? Are we dealing with a modern structure that the building is itself as a means to an end? Or are we dealing with something that may be on, the, on an historic register? Are we dealing with something that has aesthetic and has value as an object in its own right, and the preservation of that building is equally as critical as the preservation of the materials that are contained therein. And that's going to change how it is that we look at and think about going through and maintaining these relationships across the envelope. Now we're not going to spend a whole lot of time about this. This is uh, more just for information's sake so everyone understands that it exists. But as we go through and start thinking about different building types, I'd be remiss not to talk about the fact that there are already different building classifications that have been talked about, discussed, and sort of assigned for different types of structures. And these come uh, largely from ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. And if we look through and start thinking about this, it's going to look pretty familiar to everybody. We talk about class one, and these are just open structures, right? These are really just enclosed spaces. Think about if you had a roof or a pavilion, and you just throw some walls up around it. No real means, no real information for trying to, you know, create any ty different type of environment on the indoors. You're really just trying to keep whatever is inside of that structure out of the weather. And at the same time, these also don't have a lot of potential for improving the interior environment beyond that given condition, which is going to re reflect very closely what is going on outdoors. If we go to class two, uh, these are defined as sheath, post, and beam structures. You know, we think about larger, more enclosed barns or different buildings, cabins, uh, that may have wooden floors, may have earth floors, and every now and again may have a little bit of subgrade space below them. But there's no vapor barrier, there's no insulation in a structure like this. It's not necessarily meant to create an interior environment. There is ventilation that is allowed for in order to reduce heat and moisture. Uh, there may be different venting at points in the building. It may have windows available for the sake of air circulation in and out of the structure. But by and large, you expect that there's going to be an awful lot of air and moisture exchange in and out of this particular type of building. And again, that for the most part, conditions inside of the building are going to reflect very closely what is going on outdoors. Class three, we start getting into you know, some older time houses or older office buildings or different commercial structures. And you know, these are largely what we expect to find. These may have you know, a series or a large number of windows available for daylight throughout a different building, will be cut up into different rooms. Oftentimes not well insulated and virtually no vapor barrier. It's not, it wasn't intended for that by any means. And if there's a mechanical system in place, typically it's for the purpose of heating. Uh, very rarely is something in place for the sake of cooling. You're looking at older historic buildings that are allowed, that it's allowed to have heat in the wintertime for the sake of keeping water from freezing and keeping comfort uh, for human occupation, but not a whole lot of environmental control for the summer months or warmer months.
as we get into class four, and this is really about the end of where we're going to be discussing today, so I'm going to breeze through these fairly quickly. But these are newer houses, uh, sort of newer public buildings that are going to have some insulation, probably have mechanical systems that are designed not only for winter or heating control, but also for cooling and or maybe some slight dehumidification. And by and large, this is where we start getting into that class of buildings where we start thinking of structures as being tight in terms of not allowing a whole lot of air exchange, not hopefully not allowing quite as much moisture exchange. But this is where we start to think about, all right, how do we really keep the indoor environment inside and not allow an awful lot of communication between indoors and outdoors? And as we move into class five and class six, these are where we're getting into modern purpose-built structures. And really, we're talking about very well insulated, tightly a tight thermal barrier as well as a tight vapor barrier trying to make sure that the mechanical systems that are interior to these buildings are creating environments for a special purpose inside and that they're going to maintain, be able to maintain and retain that energy inside the building without a lot of exchange to the outdoors. So for today, really what we want to talk about is, if you will, you know, grant me a little bit of leniency here, but we're talking about the historic building envelopes by and large. And these typically fall into one, two, and three in terms of the ASHRAE classes. Now, class four does come into this on occasion, but really what we're looking at today is thinking about these older envelopes, not necessarily an awful lot of insulation, and by and large structures that don't have a lot of mechanical intervention. You know, we might have heat available, we might have a little bit of cooling available, but typically we're talking about these older buildings where for whatever reason, either because of the original construction or because of historic integrity, there's not a lot of means for, his, for mechanical intervention inside the structure. And the important thing to really consider when we're talking about that is that these older building envelopes were never meant to be tight. Uh, you know, I'm going to step back for just a second and say that in today's modern world, as we think about creating preservation environments and as we think about sustainability, we oftentimes have a kind of a gut reaction that we want tight, airtight structures that don't, want in, don't let in an awful lot of moisture. And we think about that not only for the sake of collections environments, which by and large is a good thing, but we even take that, you know, oftentimes to our own daily life in terms of thinking about our houses and adding insulation to increase the thermal barrier and waterproofing basements and talking about how to keep moisture at bay. But when we think about these historic buildings, the envelopes that were built, uh, the envelopes that were designed in, designed in these historic structures, we're never meant to remain tight. In fact, the reason that these envelopes have, been, have <clears throat> held up so long over so well over time is largely because of the fact that they're designed to breathe. They're supposed to let air through the envelope. They're supposed to allow moisture to move in and out of the building without blocking. And it allows things to dry out. It allows things to move back and forth and to relieve energy when necessary. Also, potentially to take on energy when necessary. So when we start to think about taking these historic structures and creating modern spaces or modern uh, environmentally controlled spaces out of them, oftentimes we're using the envelope to the wrong purpose or we're, very, we're sort of dangerously uh, using the building to something that that envelope was never meant to be able to, to, be able to sustain. Now the other aspect of this is that if we are dealing with an historic structure that is part of an historic district or where historic preservation is a concern, and that particular building again is part of the collection, then by and large even just by law and by definition we're limited in terms of what we can do for modern intervention or mechanical upgrades, both in terms of the envelope itself but also in terms of mechanical systems within the building. As we look at these historic structures, we start to find a few things that hold true, if you will. Uh, most of them will have windows, by and large, you'll notice. And those windows served a purpose. It wasn't just for daylight, although that was one critical aspect of it. But those windows were also there for natural ventilation. If we look over and see in this second diagram, notice if, remember, if we walk through historic buildings sometimes, and one thing that always comes to mind is kind of call it older college dormitories and dorm rooms. You'll notice and look above buildings, even in older office buildings, where you'll see transoms above the doors, those small little windows that look like they're just for getting in and out if you happen to lock the door on yourself. But in that case, those transoms are there so that as air comes in on one side of the building, that transom can remain open while the door is closed, thus providing some privacy. 
and allows airflow throughout the entire building when we're looking at a building that is two, or two rooms and one corridor wide. So as the air comes through, it can go through the transom, hit the hallway portion, go through another transom and back out the other side of the building, allowing for ventilation through both rooms on either side of the building. If we close off, looking for my cursor, if we close off either one of these windows or a transom, as the air comes in, it really has nowhere to go, and we don't get sufficient or realistic airflow throughout that particular space. And the idea of ventilation is unfortunately defeated. So as we see those double hung windows and we see the transoms in older structures, those served a purpose not just for allowing light through, but also a very critical purpose for allowing ventilation and fresh air to come through. And as we look over top at older structures and older buildings, what we'll find oftentimes is this H or T-shaped construction so that there are and what happens is you see an awful lot of perimeter walls. In this particular case, this structure here is part of the building. And as we look at each of these spaces and each of these four interior corners, these were light wells or courtyards that would allow these exterior walls to have windows in place so that this space on the inside of the building could not only have ventilation through that space, but also would get natural daylight from both sides of that particular structure. And as we look at buildings, we also recognize that even just beyond the idea of air movement through in terms of windows and recognizing that if we have positive pressure on one side and therefore negative pressure on another, then we can see air move from one side of the building to another, we also understand that there's a vertical air movement within a building as well. And this is what we call the stack effects. And, you know, kind of the warm air, cool air part of this I think we all know from experience that cool air tends to sink to the lower parts of a building or down to the ground, and warm air tends to rise. So as we look at a building or any structure that we're working with, the warm air in the building, by and large, is going to filter up to the top of the structure. This is why we see a lot of heat in attics or why we talk about heat loss through a, through a chimney or through any other sort of upper structure or an open vent at the top of a building, heat loss in the wintertime. It's also why we tend to see a lot of folks going through and insulating their attics and their own residences. But keep in mind, too, that that also means that in the basement, where you have oftentimes a subgrade soil condition that is going to impact the temperature of the air in that particular basement, we're going to see a lot of cooler air down in that space. And this can be good and bad in a couple of different ways. But we also, as we look at this, we have to recognize that as we talk about these temperature conditions throughout the levels of the structure, that that temperature also has an impact on the relative humidity that we're dealing with as well. So these cooler temperatures in the basement may inspire some higher relative humidities that we have to watch for. But up at the top is that warm air rises to the top of the building and exfiltrates through the upper parts of the building. We may have to contend with some lower relative humidities, particularly in the wintertime, even more so than we're used to. Now that stack effect, what are we going to have to deal with? We mentioned a little bit of this on the previous slide, but in basements, you know, that surrounding soil temperature, we're going to see some cooler temperatures. And also keep in mind that there's less exposure to exterior air and exterior weather conditions. So whatever it is that we feel temperature-wise in the basement, oftentimes doesn't have a lot to do with what's going on outdoors. It has more to do with what the condition of the soil is that's surrounding it. As we get up to the at-grade floors, usually the first floor or by sometimes the second floor, depending on how the building is arranged, we'll start to see that the temperature balances out more. And you see kind of this middling condition between what's going on in a basement and what's going on in an upper level. And, you know, I'm sure you've noticed this in the summertime if you don't have air conditioning in your own home, but your first floor may feel very similar to what it is outside or to what's going on temperature-wise outdoors. And in that regard, probably more comfortable than the upper floors, whereas we get up into the upper floors in the attics, we get two things going on. Not only do we have hot tem or warm temperatures due to rising warm air through the structure, but we also have the radiant energy that's coming through the roof of the structure and increasing the temperature in that space as well. So when we're thinking about that for collection storage, you know, what is it that we want to contend with? What is it that we want to consider? Do we want collections down in the basement where it's cooler? Those temperatures are better off for the rate of chemical decay for our materials. But at the same time, we may be dealing with higher relative humidity conditions. Or do we want them up in the upper floors of the attics where it's going to be hotter, albeit, and not be so great for the sake of chemical decay, but we might not have as many moisture problems or as, many, as much of a high relative humidity problem as we typically could. You know, and we think about it, and well, maybe we would make the argument for we should store, store collections on at-grade floors, 
Well, unfortunately, those tend to be the public spaces and aren't always available for the sake of collection storage in the long term. So just some aspects to consider, and we'll, we'll dive into these a little bit more as we move forward. Now, in historic buildings, when we talk about heat loads and heat loss, which is really that temperature condition from the indoors to the outdoors in the wintertime, if we're creating, temp creating heat inside by means of a furnace or a radiator or a boiler system, you know, we want that heat to stay inside the building. We don't really want it to get out, whereas in the summertime, we're trying to reduce the impact of heat energy on the interior of the structure from outdoors. So in that case, we want to look at awnings or shutters, curtains and shades to try and reduce some of that solar radiation coming in through our windows or through the exterior envelope. Now this is something oftentimes as we talk about what are appropriate interventions for the sake of historic structures. You know, many times you can go back through and see, all right, well, where was a porch originally on this building? And what purpose did that serve? Can we use that to our advantage in terms of reducing some of that solar energy? Or even on the interior of a building, can we use uh, blackout shades? Or can we use some sort of light and energy reducing shades in place that even though they may not be necessarily true to the historic aesthetic, still serve the purpose and are, if you will, reversible in terms of the building structure? Uh, oftentimes on older buildings, it is you know, perfectly all right to use operable windows and transoms and different attic vents for natural ventilation if that's your only choice. The key when you have a building without a lot of mechanical intervention or a way to control the interior environment is that you need to operate it as close to its original function as possible. And that means that if the windows and transoms were there to allow fresh air to move through and make sure that you're moving moisture through the building as opposed to trapping it inside of the building, that we want to be able to continue to do that. And the same thing for the attic vents to make sure that we allow that stack effect to occur. And as that warm air rises to the attic, not trap it there, but make sure that it can escape to the outdoors. Now, in some older buildings or some historic envelopes, if it's not, if the building itself is not part of your collection and we have a little bit of flexibility for modern improvement, if you will, well, then maybe we look at considering to replace the original windows or adding storm windows on the outside to reduce the radiant energy and the heat loss on the structure. Or looking at other improvements such as uh, potentially insulation where appropriate. Now, throughout the building, we can minimize lighting and equipment operation, especially during daytime hours. I know that that's awfully hard to do given the fact that this is, you know, really looking at our open periods. But you know, all things being equal, we want to try and minimize or reduce the load as much as possible. And finally, when we're looking at winter situations or heating situations, we want to try and reduce those temperatures, dial back the radiators a little bit, and try to close those heat vents as much as possible, just to make sure that we're not overheating the building, but also to make sure that as we keep that cooler temperature, that oftentimes will work in our favor and manage to keep our relative humidity a little bit higher than it might otherwise be. Uh, we've talked about that in some past webinars, so I don't want to go too far into it. Moving on to thinking about moisture, and really this is by and large the somewhat trickier one to figure out between, both, between heat energy and moisture. But as we think about that envelope, it's kind of that, it's a critical buffer for us between what is going on in moisture conditions outdoors and what it is that we have to deal with inside, whether we have a mechanical system to do it or not. And when we think about where that moisture comes from, well, it's got a whole lot of different places that it can come into our building from, right? It could come in through and on the outside air. We may have de we may have problems with precipitation in terms of roof leaks or other entry points for liquid water into the building. We may have issues with condensation, particularly in the wintertime if we're talking about humidifying an older structure. Or we may be situated on a grade where we have problems with surface moisture and or runoff. Uh, I've seen a number of different buildings in the past where if the building is on a hillside and there's a you know, significant rainstorm, the water comes down the hillside, hits the side of the building, some of it will be absorbed by the ground and start to leach in through basement walls and some of it will be redirected around the building. And the other, another aspect that we have to be concerned about is where we have a high water table in a particular geographic area concerns with groundwater and whether or not we can have moisture incursion through a basement or through some part of the subgrade structure is very significant and critical, especially if we're talking about that basement being a space that is used for either collection, storage, or display. Now, when we think about moisture movement and how it is, and let's just talk about air here for a second, and we're talking about envelope integrity, 
there are a couple different ways that moisture can move across or through an envelope and make it from outdoors to indoors or vice versa. And one of those, kind of the first one, the critical one that we want to talk about here is vapor diffusion. And vapor diffusion, by and large, and this is kind of, you know, backing off a little bit or giving kind of a broad definition, if you will, but it's that movement of moisture from areas of high vapor pressure to an area of low vapor pressure. And to think about that in very broad terms, this isn't the only factor involved. But what we're really thinking about is the fact that moisture, if we have a high relative humidity condition, and temperatures are fairly similar from outdoors to indoors, but if we have a high relative humidity condition on one side of a building and a low relative humidity condition on the other side, let's say that we're air conditioning, for example, then the more, just by uh, means of vapor pressure, moisture is going to seek to move across that envelope from the area of high concentration, from that high vapor pressure condition outdoors, and it's going to want to move to the inside condition. So here's an example of it right here in this particular diagram. Now in this case we have not only different relative humidities, but we have significantly different temperatures, which means that there's a different absolute humidity that we're dealing with. But in this case, we see that moisture outdoors is going to want to move indoors very, very rapidly or in high concentration because there's a much lower vapor pressure on the interior of this particular structure. Now, as we think about that over the course of the season or the course of multiple seasons, we recognize that you know, as we're looking at summer conditions and comparing outdoor conditions to indoor conditions, in the summertime, moisture is going to want to move into our building. It's going to, the outdoors is that higher concentration of moisture, it's that higher vapor pressure condition. And where we're trying to remove moisture on the interior of our building in the summer, we create that low vapor pressure condition or that low vapor content, and it's good that the vapor, the moisture from outdoors is going to want to move inside of the building. Now if we reverse that and look at when time and talk about humidifying a particular structure or adding moisture to the inside of the building, even just with, shall we say, normal moisture loads, we're going to have a case where the moisture inside of the building may very, may very well be of a larger concentration or higher vapor pressure than what we're dealing with outdoors. And that means that moisture in that case is going to reverse its flow across the envelope and move from inside toward the outside. Now, what do we see when that, when that may happen? We have a couple different things that may go on. Uh, spalling is one example of this, where we actually lose some surface condition or some surface material off of the exterior of a building is oftentimes where it occurs. But in this case, here's an image of spalling down in the lower left. And in this case, we probably have a situation where if we're humidifying inside of this structure in the wintertime, and that moisture is being forced through the envelope to the outside, that final outer layer of the envelope is losing some of its integrity and is chipping away as that moisture tries to push through and essentially over time degrades the structure of that exterior surface. Now over here on the other side we see a couple of examples of what goes on when we're thinking about the interior and the fact that moisture is moving from outdoors to indoors. And these are examples here down here we have a little bit of spalling and some efflorescence going on. In this particular case, up at the upper right, we have some efflorescence that we're dealing with. And this is where moisture from outdoors is trying to move toward the interior environment. And as it moves across that envelope, is picking up different minerals or different salts and carrying it with the water through the, through the envelope, through the surface. As the moisture reaches the interior surface and evaporates, it leaves behind that mineral deposit or that salt in the form of, eff of efflorescence on the surface of the structure. And you'll see this an awful lot when we start to look at basements in buildings or when you start to look at older masonry walls or older brick walls. Uh, I can think of a couple different library stack towers where I've seen this happen in the past. But this is just one of those examples of you know, what happens when we see moisture in the process of diffusion across an envelope from the indoors or outdoors to inside. Another way that moisture can move into a building is simply being carried along by air. And when we think about air leakage, usually we're more concerned with that in terms of the temperature impact and what it is that it's going to do to the temperature condition inside of a building. But keep in mind that as air leaks into a building through whatever means of egress that it can find or ingress in, that, in, our, in this particular case that it can find, it's going to carry some of that moisture along with it. So as we see this high concentration, this high relative humidity moist air coming in from the outdoors, it's going to come inside and as, even as that temperature changes, it's bringing the moisture inside along with it. And the downside, what we can find here is that we wind up with higher relative humidity conditions in the summer. 
And in the wintertime, if we're humidifying and losing some of that moisture condition that we create inside the building, we notice that we start to lose that to the outdoors through some of these air gaps and air leaks. Now, one aspect of this that, at least in the summertime, in terms of making sure that moisture-laden air doesn't come into the building, one aspect or one option is if we have mechanical systems and a forced air system, uh, we can create positive pressure inside of a building. We'll talk a little bit more about that next month. But we can, if you will, push enough air into the space that the air movement is always from the inside out as opposed to from the outside in. And, you know, that's a good choice, especially maybe for the summertime if you're careful about making sure that the moisture doesn't get locked up inside the wall. Uh, but that being said, it really only works in situations where we have mechanical systems and mechanical operations a choice. When we're thinking about moisture concerns, what is it that we need to be thinking about or being aware of? Uh, we want to watch for liquid seepage in different subgrade or basement environments, especially on walls and floors. You can have moisture coming up through the floor of a structure. Uh, there are a couple of different solutions and, if you will, coatings uh, that will work in terms of trying to block some of that moisture movement for both floors and walls. Uh, we do have to be careful about using those, particularly with historic structures. Uh, watch for any sort of damage gutter or downspout on the outside or any drainage problems in general. Make sure that where water is, where there's infrastructure on the building to try and remove water from the building area, make sure that that's functioning properly. And not only that the drains are open and clear and that water can move away, but also that the gutters in the down, the gutters in particular aren't clogged up or able to actually move the water away from the edge of the building as opposed to the water coming down and soaking into the ground directly next to the foundation. We want to watch for high levels of groundwater in particular seasons, especially if you're near a stream or near a pond. Uh, vegetation close to the building. This is one oftentimes that we tend to overlook. Uh, we'll plant for decorative or in sometimes even shading purposes. We'll put vegetation awfully close to the side of a structure. And what we find, unfortunately, is that, if you will, that shading and not only the lower temperature that we get as a result, or at least the lack of radiant energy that we get for, as a result, but also just the fact that the vegetation itself tends to hold moisture in, you find an awful lot of circumstances where there's been some moisture damage to the exterior of a building due to vegetation, be it a tree, be it ivy, be it bushes, too close to a particular part of the exterior envelope. We want to look for uh, leaks that would allow moisture in, whether that's at a roof or a wall or at a window, and gaps in terms of looking at foundations. Now, there may or may not be a vapor, beer, vapor barrier present, but especially as we look at older buildings and older stone foundations, as you move through, watch the mortar joints on those. Uh, look for places where those joints may have failed. Look for places where you may need to do some repair. And oftentimes these are noticeable just by seeing a water stain or some sort of a liquid stain down the side of an interior basement wall. And finally, those porous exterior walls, uh, whether brick or whether some other form of stone or masonry, these are all porous materials that are meant to allow moisture to move through. And if we have a situation where there's no vapor barrier in place, where that building was designed to breathe, then you need to watch to make sure that you're not either allowing too much moisture to come into the building and causing problems on the interior of the structure, but at the same time making sure that you're not pushing moisture to the outside. And seeing as we did in that last slide, examples of that spalling were moisture to the outside that actually damaged the exterior of the envelope. Looking at those basement walls and floors, just a few examples. Here we are. You know, we have some cases of materials that are bagged sitting almost directly on top of the floor. They look to be up a little bit off of the actual floor surface. But we can see some of the dampness in the sheen on, in that particular case that's caused by water on the floor. Down below we see water where instead of the downspout routing into a drain or routing into something that moves the moisture away from the building, it pretty much just drops right down next to the side of the building, and even though there may be a pipe down there, really it's just getting into the earth and sitting right next to the foundation. And this is, you know, kind of a common problem when we look at how moisture is routed around a particular building site. The goal is to get the water away from the building as much as we possibly can. So if gutters aren't already in place, and if they are appropriate to the aesthetic of the building, Gutters and downspouts are critical, and if the historic ones are in place, making sure that they're repaired properly and functioning properly is absolutely important. We want to watch for any perimeter leaks. Where possible, if we have the choice, try to slope the ground away from the foundation so that any runoff that does come down off of the roof or that any, or any, any rainfall or any runoff that occurs just along the sides of the building 
instead of being gathered along the edges of that foundation, it can be moved away from the structure and out away from the building itself. And we were talking about vegetation a minute ago, but a good rule of thumb, something just to keep in mind, is to try and keep vegetation at least two feet away from the building to allow for an air gap in between and allow for circulation and to allow the sides of the building, the envelope, to dry out. Drainage concerns, what we might we run into, and we see an awful lot of these. Uh, it's kind of ironic, just in the past few months, I've seen two or three of these where you have an actual stream that runs underneath of a building. Uh, in this case, you know, on one hand, uh, one institution did it very well, and it was routed into a drainage pipe that went underneath the building. And in another case, this over here was the drainage pipe underneath the building. And they wondered why they had high relative humidity conditions in the display case directly over top of this panel. And when you open up the panel and see the sludge and the small creek that's running underneath the floor in that particular location, you start to understand why the higher understand where the high RH problems were coming from. And part of that is really just to understand your building site, understand what it is you're dealing with. If you have, you know, this ranges from sitting directly on top of bedrock and making sure that the water can drain away from the building uh, because it's not going to soak in, it's going to stay right on the surface of the rock for a while. Or if you're dealing with something where you've even just, you know, let's say you have a normal dirt uh, soil layer underneath the building, making sure that as the water comes in that it can't deposit underneath the structure or create a condition where that damp or where that uh, higher RH, higher relative humidity or moisture condition from the earth can rise up through into the basement of the structures. In this particular case, you know, let's try to reroute the water around the building. So here we had a situation where the moisture came down off of the roof into the gutter, but the gutter dumped all the moisture directly down into this corner of the building. The hill in this case slopes down that direction and all the water just went right through there, went directly into the building and just sat there and started to seep up through and as you went into the basement you saw almost year-round mold growth in that particular location because any water runoff was concentrated right underneath the building. Now if you can't direct that around the building and try to get it, let's say, to go out here to the side of the building and down that slope, then that's a case where you want to try, if you can, to capture it in a drain pipe and route it. In this case we had a porch right here on this particular side of the building where you could catch it in a drain pipe and route it underneath that porch and out here to the driveway so that it never had a chance to sit underneath the structure itself. So keep that in mind. Think about your building siting and think about what it is that you're dealing with in terms of topography and your own situation. Now if we're thinking about the envelope of the building and what can we do to keep moisture from coming in, well, there are a lot of different ways to approach it and what I want to say in general is that oftentimes the modern solution, or if you will, let's just call it window replacement, is not necessarily the right answer. Uh, for a lot of these historic structures, we do have to keep them true to form and true to their original structure. So the key is to repair it and try to do the best job that you can to the original intent and try to make sure that the original design and the original way that the building was meant to function, that it can do that as effectively as possible. So in the case of a window, it doesn't necessarily mean replacing the window, although it may mean replacing an individual piece of glass or an individual light. But you know, what you want to look at is can we repair the putty that's around the individual light and around the muttons and make sure that there's not an air gap through, the, an air gap, air gap through there that is larger than it was supposed to be. Try to restrict some of that air movement and allow the window to perform as it initially was supposed to. And over time, if we've had any damage to the sills or any degraded rails on the windows themselves, again, try to repair those and make changes to those so that in terms of air tightness and moisture tightness, the structure can operate as it was initially intended. You know, we look at wooden floors and historic structures over time, and as you start to look at those floorboards, not only do you see damage over long-term periods, but you also just start to see the impact of mechanical decay over time, where the wood has shrunk and expanded multiple times over the years just due to moisture content in the surrounding environment that once was initially a sealed surface, now you look down and you can see, let's say from the second floor to the first floor in some cases, or oftentimes what I found in different situations is you have fairly significant gaps through a floorboard down into the basement of a particular structure. And in these cases, again, it's not necessarily replacing the floor or filling it with modern wood, which can be more problematic than anything but thinking about what that initial seal may have been and of trying to approach or model something that is fairly close. And that can be anything from mixed sawdust to hemp rope that's been soaked in linseed oil. There are a couple of different 
historically appropriate uh, repairs and fixes for this that you can look at and just you know try to do something again that matches the original intent of the structure and the surface or the material performance. And on interior and exterior walls, you know, all I wanted to say, you know, as a broad caution here, is be very cautious about adding modern materials, be it insulation, be, be it, sorry, be it insulation, or be it modern layers or modern cladding or exterior cladding that may change the behavior of that wall function in terms of how well it allows moisture to pass through or allows air to pass through. These walls were really oftentimes meant to breathe. They're allowed to allow, they're meant to allow moisture to transfer from the indoors to the outdoors and from vice versa. And if you start to block that with modern construction, let's say putting up how, let's say putting up Tyvek or putting up some form of vapor barrier on the exterior of a building, especially of an historic structure, then you run the risk of trapping moisture in that particular wall and allowing if that moisture were to condense in colder conditions, you start to introduce possibilities of mechanical damage not only inside the wall, but also looking at problems of rot and mold growth over time as well. So as we were saying, you know, just some key points to think about think about are if you're looking at repair, especially on historic envelopes, if that repair is required, you're trying to do it again to the original intent and try to use the, pre the period appropriate methods and materials where available. For any of these structures, even if we're talking about ones that have some basic heating control or some basic mechanical system in place, oftentimes the goal shouldn't be to try and make the envelope tight. The building, the construction, the materials were never meant to hold up to that. The goal is really to try and return the envelope to the original optimal function, which is allowing it to breathe appropriately. And you know, far be it for me, the one thing that I really want to recommend to everyone as we think about these issues, you know, we're far from the experts on this topic, but there are a number of experts out there on historic preservation and historic methods in terms of repair and making sure that envelopes behave properly and work with those folks. That's why they're out there. Make sure that what it is that you're doing to repair and try to maintain a particular environment inside of your building is not going to damage your building itself or damage your envelope to your building over time. So moving on and just thinking, you know, kind of roughly about environmental management inside of some of these historic structures. You know, I don't want to get too far into the mechanical systems. We'll talk about that the next time around. But what we need to understand is that a lot of these structures, especially when we think about historical home, or historic homes and when we think about older buildings, have in the past had some means of heating in them. Now, it may have been so rudimentary as just a fireplace. Or it may have been something along the lines of a gravity furnace, or it could have been a, a boiler or a steam radiator system. But oftentimes these have had some means of mechanical control in the past in order to create a separate interior environment. And when we see that, and we do it all the time in our personal structures and inside of our own homes, but the temptation oftentimes is to modernize, right? We say, well, let's put in a modern furnace or put in a modern boiler system or air conditioning and let's you know, create the interior environment that we want. And at the same time, we're going to add insulation, and we're going to think about, an, think about a vapor barrier, and we're going to try and make sure that this historic home, this historic structure, this historic building can function the same way as a modern building. Well, there are a couple problems with that. There are a couple of risks that we face when we start to think about that approach. One of those is the very simple reality of we could disturb that historic structural aesthetic what it is that makes it an historic structure to begin with, what it is that put it on that national register, what it is that put it on the historic preservation list to begin with. And once you're on, once you're in some of those categories, and this is the truth for a lot of us out there in smaller cultural institutions, once we've had a building put onto that historic register, register into that historic preservation list, we no longer have the option of doing a lot of modernization, not only in terms of the exterior, but also in terms of the interior and the mechanics. So we have to keep that in mind and be very careful about what it is that we're proposing or thinking about doing. But again, to and I realize now that I've probably reiterated this point plenty of times throughout this talk, you know, but the other case there is, again, just to make sure that you know, we're trying to understand that the house and the structure, in order to preserve that structure, we need to allow it to do what it was supposed to do. And if we try to hold it to these modern tight moisture control methods that we're looking at for brand new buildings and brand new structures, that that envelope isn't going to hold up particularly well to that in a lot of cases. And we need to take a lot of care of what it is we're asking that building to do.
you know, we see a lot of different examples where it's best intentions and things that have gone wrong over time. You'll see modern installations and mechanical systems into older buildings or historic buildings. And someone will say, well, I've, I've got a collection storage environment in here. I need to make sure that my relative humidity in the wintertime stays up above 30%. So we're going to add a humidifier to this system, and we're going to humidify a portion of this house. And you walk in and realize that, well, with the original windows and the original, not only the wooden windows, but the single pane glazing in many cases, that those structures were never meant to hold up to humidification. You have a lot of cold spots along exterior walls and exterior windows that are going to allow condensation to form on both the windows and the walls. And in some cases, as you see the damage on this particular window, it may be surface damage that you can see, that you can identify, and that is repairable. But if you're not careful and you're forcing moisture through humidification and positive pressure into the structure of the building, inside of the walls, then you may run into a situation where condensation on the inside of the wall isn't visible, isn't something that you will see, and may cause structural damage or rot or mold problems inside of a wall where it may not be found for years to come. Along the same lines, if we look at older buildings again and think about what we might do for summer control for preservation environments on the inside, we say, all right, well, I know that I need lower relative humidity conditions for long-term collection storage, so I'm going to dehumidify. I'm going to install a new you know, modern mechanical system that can remove moisture from the air and condense that out of the system and create a lower RH in my interior environment. Well, again, without that right, without the proper envelope structure, you run into the problem of now that we've created that lower vapor pressure condition on the inside of the building, those, that vapor condition on the outside, that moisture from the outside of the structure is going to try to move into the building. And in this case, air pressure doesn't make a difference. It's really just the concentration of moisture on either side of the building. If we have a low concentration moisture condition on the interior, a high concentration moisture from the outside is going to try to get in. And as it does that and moves through the envelope, we're going to see those problems with spalling on the inside or those problems in particular, in particular with efflorescence on the inside of the building as we go through and realize that moisture is still coming into the building, again, through, if you will, best intentions of trying to dry the building out, all we're doing is encouraging moisture to move through the envelope that much faster. And that brings us to the idea of vapor barriers. And I don't want to go too far into this because it's kind of a rabbit hole. We could probably spend an hour and a half alone talking about vapor barriers and the relative uh, shall we say, good points and bad points about them in different types of structures and different climates. But I want to just leave you with the idea here for the moment of, you know, accept the fact that vapor barriers, for all that we talk about them, as critical to modern structures in terms of making sure that we can maintain the appropriate moisture conditions on the inside of the building, when we're looking at historic structures or when you're looking at adding them to a building retroactively, it can be uh, a gamble let's just say. Uh, depending on where you put that vapor barrier, whether on the interior or the exterior of the building, depending on the climate that you're in, and depending on how your structure is built, whether you're dealing with wood or with masonry and what different layers you have within the wall, you can really create some quite significant and problematic conditions depending on how and where you place that vapor barrier on a building envelope. So if you're considering that and you're thinking about, well, should I have a vapor barrier in my historic building or in my particular structure, to try and have better relative humidity control on the inside of the building. Again, by all means, get in touch with someone out there that is an expert in those matters and make sure that you talk with them, not just about how effective it might be for controlling conditions on the interior environment, but what the consequences to the exterior envelope might be, depending on where you place that vapor barrier and how it functions with the rest of the wall structure. So we understand that as moisture moves through the building, moves through the envelope, in and out in some of these historic structures or older envelopes, or as we recognize too, just that we have heat load that we're dealing with and contending with and air leaks that may move in and out or across a particular envelope, we recognize that you know, by and large spaces don't hold those uniform conditions, that we have microclimates, we have these different conditions that we may find on the perimeter of a space or on the interior of a space that we have to figure out, all right, not just how do we contend with those, but also how do we identify them? How do we recognize where they may exist and what do we do about making sure that we know when they're happening and where they're happening? And, you know, looking back a little bit, we can think about stack effect or thinking about leaks in the envelope and moisture incursion. 
and recognizing that especially along the perimeter is where we might find a number of these different microclimates that we have to contend with. Now, for a basement situation where we're talking about subgrade spaces, one critical aspect here is to make sure that we're looking at dew point conditions to identify whether or not there's additional moisture coming into the building through subgrade conditions or through a subgrade wall or floor. And as we're identifying those microclimates, you know, one thing to keep in mind here is that you know, one quick tool that's in the toolbox in addition to the data loggers that hopefully we're typically using throughout different spaces is that just for spot checking or making sure that we can see smaller microclimates throughout a space, using an infrared thermometer to walk around and just check surface temperatures around a particular space will get us a lot of the way there. One thing to keep in mind here is that, you know, accuracy is important when we're th talking about these IR thermometers. But even more so, and I would make the argument for this, it's understanding what the comparative value is. So if you're two degrees off in terms of temperature on the accuracy of a particular IR gun, maybe that's not the end of the world, but what we're really looking for is making sure that we know that this particular exterior wall is three degrees cooler than the interior surfaces we move in, or even worse, maybe it's five or six degrees cooler along a lower, uh, shall we say, juncture between a wall and a floor. And that low temperature in that case is where we should start looking to make sure that we don't have a high relative humidity condition and that we're not just through means of temperature in particular creating a mold growth situation or some other relative humidity uh, problem or incre increase of degradation risk that we need to watch for. And when we think about our structures, really there are two places where these microclimates tend to exist. And unfortunately, because of the way we use our buildings, they also happen to coincide where, with where we tend to place collections for long-term storage, especially when we don't have a lot of options. So I'll start out here, we'll talk, start at the top of the building and just talk about attic storage. Well, what goes on? What do we run into? We know that on the roof, on an attic, we have some radiant energy that's coming down from sun or from any whatever, you know, maybe you have a little bit more sunshine where you are than we do in Rochester, but we still have some radiant energy that gets in through the roof. But we also have particular problems with rain, with a lot of moisture incursion that may come in through a roof leak or through ice dams backing up in the wintertime. So that attic space already has higher potential problems in terms of higher temperatures as well as high relative humidity conditions. Not only that, but oftentimes, whether it's because of attic venting or whether it's because of failures in the envelope, we may have issues in terms of well, pests or biological decay, if you will. We might have birds or insects or bats or something else getting into that particular space that we need to keep an eye on that may make it, shall we say, not the best choice for long-term collection storage. And beyond that, just because we don't always get up there and because there is a lot of different material that can give off particulate, we tend to see a lot of dust accumulation in the attic. Over time, though, our biggest concerns really are high temperatures that come with that radiant energy and warm temperature condition in the summertime. And those high temperatures over time are going to accelerate the rate of chemical decay. This is one of the higher risks that we have to be concerned about. And the result of that, you know, unfortunately, when we go to historic so historical societies and look at smaller cultural institutions, you see the same thing over and over again. You see a lot of brittle paper. You see a lot of different split or warped furniture or wood. You see a lot of cloth or textile that has failed over time and a lot of accelerated aging, unfortunately, in photographs. So just to <clears throat> put a rather ugly picture to the potential, but you know, if you've never had a roof leak before, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, but you have to be up in that space and make sure that you're monitoring for moisture problems or leaks, at least on a very regular basis. And you want to try and keep the materials away from the likely sources of moisture, so keep them away from the eaves of the building. Make sure you try to keep them away from where there are any penetrations through the roof, either for a vent pipe or other purposes. Uh, watch in that space, look for evidence of pests, uh, whether it's dirt trails, look for, oftentimes this is where IPM comes into play, make sure that you have glue traps spread throughout the space and making sure that you're keeping an eye of what, on what the traffic may be through the area. Uh, try to keep materials away from direct sunlight if there are any windows within that attic space, but also make sure that if, there is, if there's venting available in that attic, first make sure it's screened off so pests can't come in through it, but make sure that you do allow those vents to function properly, not only to give off heat that may come up through the stack effect, but also to provide air circulation across sort of through the front and back surfaces of a building, if you will. So we go down through, and this is just by means of example. This is data that came out of a 
out of an attic space in an historical society in uh, New England. But looking down through, you recognize, oh, looks like we had a little bit. We've lost audio for a minute. And Chris is going to let me know as soon as we come back on. All right, looks like we're back. Sorry if we lost people there for a minute. We had a lag on the slide, and we also lost audio. Uh, so looking at this particular uh, set of metrics and thinking about attic storage again, this is looking, this particular set of data came from an attic space and an uh, historical society in New England, and recognizing over time that there's not much to write home about in terms of that long-term preservation environment. Uh, we've got problems not only with the rate of chemical degradation, but also with moisture in terms of high moisture conditions, especially uh, increased mold risk conditions, probably oftentimes in swing seasons. Uh, we'll give an example of that here in a minute. But also those high moisture conditions over time are going to cause significant problems for metal corrosion. And you know, when we think about high moisture conditions, first of all, they are oftentimes present within attics, within attic spaces. But we tend to think about basement storage as the larger risk when it comes to high moisture conditions and high relative humidity in buildings. And you know, as we break down through that, what are what are the results that we might see? And I'm sure you've all run into, run into this in the past. You know, mold problems, mildew issues in basements, uh, increased insect activity, especially with different types of um, different types of pests, silverfish being one of the book collections that really enjoy those high moisture environments. Uh, issues with metal corrosion, not only in terms of three-dimensional objects, but also in photograph collections. And mechanical damage to different materials over time, not only book and paper, but also looking at different wood and furniture collections, veneer on different uh, pieces of furniture, and different joints as well. So as we think about basement storage strategies, if we have to store materials within a basement space, you know, just some good ground rules to keep in mind. Try to make sure that you're keeping materials away from exterior walls. And don't get them up close to the ceiling. We're going to run into some, as we see that stack effect, you'll notice oftentimes that if you go into a basement and start, you know, if you will, using that IR gun on different surfaces within the basement, you get a pretty significant temperature difference from the floor to the ceiling. And if you place data loggers, you also see as partially as means of the temperature, but also in terms of where the moisture is coming into the structure, you'll see that you have some pretty significant moisture content differences from the floor to the ceiling of a basement area as well. Uh, try not to have materials in direct contact with cold, damp floors. That's going to allow for any hygroscopic materials. It's going to allow moisture to wick directly up through into the object. And the other thing is, you know, oftentimes we have the best intentions with using plastic and dust covers over top of different objects and materials. But if we allow those to drape over the floor, those just trap the moisture that's coming up through the floor in and create a microenvironment underneath that particular dust cover or plastic that's going to increase the local relative humidity that that object is living within. A number of different buildings that we use or a number of different organizations that we're a part of oftentimes will have different seasonal hours to the point of even uh, building closures during particular seasons. Uh, this in particular, we're looking at the Keeper's Cottage in a lighthouse on an island off the coast of Maine. And this is a case where every winter between October and June, uh, that structure actually is buttoned up, closed up, and with other than maybe a small handful of occasions, not entered for the better part of about eight months. And in that case, you know, every year when we would go back into that space in the springtime, there was mold outbreak uh, throughout the building, especially due to high moisture, con due to high moisture contents and warmer conditions in the spring. And the goal in places like this is to make sure, again, that the building is functioning as it was originally intended, and try to make sure that you can use some data loggers in that space to understand what the environment is being, or what the building itself is being exposed to in terms of the environment. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that we th as we think about these buildings being closed up and moisture transfer usually to the inside of the building over time, what that's going to result in literally throughout the country, any place that is dealing with you know, colder winter conditions oftentimes still see high relative humidity, high outdoor relative humidities. That relative humidity condition is going to transfer through to the building over the course of the winter without any heating in operation. And as the objects within the environment are able to soak up even that small amount of moisture that's available, that high RH condition that becomes localized or equilibrated within the object as temperatures increase and temperatures warm up in the spring are going to invite opportunities for mold growth.
And if we look at those graphs from one particular room in that building over time, we'll understand you know, what that risk really is, is that throughout the year, whoops, sorry if the cursor was there for a while, guys. But throughout the year, we notice that, you know, look, even here in December and on into January, we have very high relative, relative humidity conditions to deal with. And as we start to increase temperatures here in April, May, and June up into the, you know, 50 to 60 degree range, we're oftentimes contending with RH conditions of 75 and 80 percent that over time are going to allow mold to grow on different, on dif different surfaces within that particular space. So thinking broadly just about strategies for improvement, you know, the first one is which is our priority here? You know, a lot of us are, contend are contending with this very real problem of having an historic structure where the structure itself is part of the collection, if you will, the single largest object in our collection. And its own preservation is critical. It's paramount to the organization and in some cases maybe it's why the organization exists. But at the same time, we have the materials that we're storing on the inside of this structure that we're trying to create an appropriate preservation environment for. And when we think about book and paper, and when we think about photographs, and when we think about furniture and paintings and other museum objects over time, you know, we've already talked an awful lot about what the appropriate preservation conditions are for, long, for longevity for these materials. And we're looking for cooler temperatures. We're looking for moderate moisture conditions, moderate relative humidities, which are very difficult to achieve inside of any structure without mechanical intervention. And as we showed going back through some of those examples, it can be very dangerous to just place that mechanical intervention on top of a structure or an envelope that wasn't designed to deal with it or that wasn't designed to behave in that sort of a particular environment. So we have to sometimes make a choice and think about you know, whether or not our primary goal here is preserving the structure and how it is that the structure has to perform with the outdoors and or whether or not the primary goal is to make sure that we create the appropriate preservation environment inside and that the envelope and the structure are really just sort of along for the ride. You're trying to find if there is one, uh, a happy medium, a happy compromise between the two and I will say that that can be a very difficult thing to do simultaneously. Uh, for any historic envelope, really do consider those envelope improvements. If you will, these are passive control of your interior environment instead of going the mechanical route. But look at trying to repair the original envelope to, as we said before, to its original intent. Uh, when we start thinking about modern solutions, whether it's the addition of thermal insulation or thinking about window replacements, thinking about vapor barriers, be very cautious about taking those routes and really do your homework. Think about it very carefully before you start using modern intervention on historic buildings. And finally, and I realize that this oftentimes is not uh, possible for a lot of different institutions, but it's a, a good thing to have in your list of things to consider, which is to, if, if you have a hard time kind of resolving how it is that you preserve that exterior and that exterior envelope and structure with how you create the appropriate preservation environment on the inside, then give it some thought in terms of whether or not you could create the appropriate preservation environment for collections materials in a different location, in a building that is, shall we say, uh, better designed to withstand some of those conditions or where the preservation of the building isn't quite as critical. Uh, you know, looking at those possibilities and thinking about just using that building or that space rather than long-term storage as a display means or as an interpretive space uh, really can do an awful lot for thinking about long-term preservation for other aspects of the collection. Some ways to contend with high relative humidity over time when we're thinking about different envelopes. By and large, you know, try to control moisture at the source. Don't necessarily try to deal with it once it gets inside. Try to keep it from ever getting inside to begin with. So look very carefully at your roof drainage. Look at how surface water is routed around the building and what you may have in place or what you're dealing with with subsurface water. Maybe you can go to a French drain system or maybe you can do some other uh, means of mitigation on the exterior of the building that won't interrupt the historic integrity of the structure. And think about, you know, we see this time and time again, Think about how it is that you're dealing with the rest of the site. Um, watering systems, sprinklers, irrigation systems, I've seen it thrown right against the side of uh, building brick and masonry structures before and folks wonder why they have mold and moss growth. Um, reduce moisture vapor infiltration through the envelope as much as possible. Um, you know, really look at those entries and windows and doors and try to keep things as tight as possible to the original intent. Uh, 
But if it comes to the point of thinking about vapor barriers and how it is that you add that moisture block up on the envelope of the building, again, think about how it is that it is going to enter the particular barrier. And this is the thing to admit. Okay, can I, or if you can, just know that we have a All right, folks, we're going to apologize here. We're having some technical difficulties with uh, connectivity in this. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me again. I was told that I was auto-tuning fairly badly and that it wasn't just my voice that was in that monotone, but uh, hopefully we're back now and you can hear me. But just to go down through here real quick, uh, you know, as I was saying, I'm going to be one of the first persons to, one of the first people to encourage you to not use outside air inside of preservation environments. But these structures, these buildings are a case where there are a lot of occasions where outside air and making sure that you have good ventilation is, is absolutely critical to maintaining the right conditions inside of an historic structure. So think about it in terms of when the exterior conditions are appropriate, obviously not on a rainy day, but if you have a good dry day outside and you need to have some ventilation through the building, use it to your advantage. Make sure that you can try and equalize the temperature throughout the structure and try to allow moisture to move in and out of the building as appropriate. In wintertime, if you're dealing with uh, high relative humidity issues, you're dealing with, you know, how do we deal or how do we contend with moisture content? You know, if you have the opportunity to, you can use some conservation heating, maybe turn on that heating system in the shoulder seasons to try and drop the relative humidity a little bit. Uh, using the other aspect of this too is to, you know, if you don't have a lot of moisture control options, if you're really just dealing with natural ventilation, feel free and make sure that you, where appropriate, make sure that you can use fans and air circulation to try and reduce that risk of mold growth and high relative humidity microclimates. If you keep that air stirred and keep things mixing fairly well, moisture will, will disperse throughout the space. And there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of data out there that does show that air circulation can significantly reduce the rate of mold growth or the risk of mold growth in buildings. Now, if you're running into low relative humidity problems, I know that that's not a case for most of us, and I apologize again for really, in terms of this entire talk, focusing in on seasonal, on climates that have different seasonal conditions. But for low relative humidity conditions, one thing to check and make sure is that, you know, where possible, make sure that you don't have a lot of air leakage or a lot of vapor exfiltration through the, through the envelope and make the repairs where appropriate. We've gone into a lot of buildings where they're, whether through loss of putty or loss of some other sealants, you see a lot of windows with gaps in them where there's just direct air exchange to the outside. A lot of doors over time that have an inch or two inch gap at the base of it that just allow air to move in and out at will. So try and, you know, if you have a low relative humidity problem, try and reduce that air movement a little bit or reduce, make it less easy for vapor to get out through the exterior of the building. And in the wintertime in particular, this is where we usually run into it and, and sort of northeast or northern U.S. climates, and I'm sure this is, I know this is true at different, uh, different areas around the world, but in the wintertime, if you're dealing with low relative humidity conditions just due to low ambient moisture content, make sure that you don't overheat your structure. Now, a lot of us think about, you know, 70 to 72 degrees as being a comfort zone for a public building or for a display, or a display space for uh, public interpretation. But in the wintertime, make sure that you try to hold some lower temperatures in order to keep that relative humidity just a little bit higher. And especially when the building is unoccupied, by all means, you know, drop that temperature back. 60 degrees, 55 degrees in many cases is perfectly ac acceptable. And drop that temperature back to try and keep the relative humidity a little bit higher and to slow down that rate of chemical decay. You know, there are interventions that we can think about, and really this is, this is sort of broader strategic thinking is where possible, where you can, make sure that you store the collections away from those high-risk areas that we've talked about. You know, attics and basements, I know unfortunately we have to use them oftentimes, but where possible, try to keep them out of those spaces. If you can designate a room somewhere on the first or lower floors of a building that can be part of your collection storage, that's oftentimes a better way to go. And again, try to keep those collections away from exterior surface, away from those, 
outside walls where there's not only the risk of moisture incursion and whether it's a leak or whether it's just through diffusion through the wall, uh, having a high moisture content space, but also keeping it away from those cold surfaces, or particularly in wintertime. And finally, think about employing different layers of protection. We've talked about this in the past, especially with the equilibration talk of a few weeks ago. But think about what, how you can go about using storage furniture and appropriate enclosures to slow down the movement of moisture from the exterior environment inside of our building, which may be appropriate for the envelope, but which may not be appropriate for a certain part of your collection. So if you can use some good quality housing or good quality cabinets with a little bit of silica or other ability or means to create a microclimate in there, think about going that route to try and create a little bit better preservation environment for certain aspects of the collection. We've got about 10 minutes left here for, collect or for questions, but I do just want to say here on eight, August 12th in about a month, we're going to go through and talk kind of the first talk that we're going to do on mechanical systems. Hope you can join us. We're going to go through some of the introductory stuff. This is really thinking about how systems work, what some of the basic designs are, and how it is that they go about using energy. A lot of the you know sort of more energy saving and other operations or options for uh, different sustainability procedures are going to be covered the month after that. So hopefully you'll be able to be able to join us again here in August. The project website, as always, is ipisustainability.org. Uh, this talk will has been recorded and will be available uh, for viewing uh, through a link on that page, usually within about 24 hours. And we'll also be posting a PDF of the slides from the talk today, uh, again, usually within 24 hours at that site. We're going to answer questions here for a couple of minutes, but please, at the end of this, uh, do take a couple of minutes and answer the questions that we're going to send out on the post-webinar survey to you. Uh, NEH really does like to see what your response was to these different talks and presentations that we're giving, and it also helps us understand how to improve uh, a number of these different talks for the future. So we really do appreciate your feedback on those points. All right, we're going to pull out some questions here for a minute, so bear with me for one second. All right, I've got two questions that are coming up right now, and it looks like da, 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 they, all right, looks like they're related here. This one's coming in from Lisa Rowan, and the initial question is, so is using a dehumidifier in a specific room that has high relative humidity not a good thing? Is it promoting more moisture to come through the walls? And Lisa, without necessarily addressing the good or bad thing right off the bat, I am going to say that yes, you are promoting more moisture to come through the walls. By removing moisture from that, inter from that interior environment, you are reducing the vapor pressure on the inside of the structure that is going to encourage moisture to come through the envelope and into the room in many cases. So you have to recognize that if you're using the dehumidifier, what you have to watch or keep in mind is that by doing so, you're going to have to continue doing so. More moisture will continue to come into the room. And you want to be conscious of what your wall construction is or what it is that your envelope construction may be and make sure that as you're you know, encouraging that diffusion through the wall, encouraging moisture to come in through the envelope, thinking about whether or not that's going to have an impact on the interior surface of the wall for moisture coming through and evaporating. Um, looks like we have, all right, I've got a couple different ones here. So let me see this one real quick. I've got a question from Elizabeth Morse. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, you mentioned chemical decay in the attic environment, but did not include mechanical damage, which I often see. Can you comment? Uh, absolutely. As Elizabeth, you're completely right. Um, there is oftentimes a problem with mechanical damage in, in attic spaces. In our experience, or at least in my experience, you, kinda, you tend to have two things going on. The first one is in the summertime, even though you have an awful lot of shall we say, higher temperature condition in an attic environment, which would typically uh, mean that you had a lower relative humidity condition, you still have a lot of moisture transfer, oftentimes just because of direct venting. So the moisture content inside of that space is still going to be relatively high during the summer months. You don't really see the RH drop all that much in those spaces. And then in the winter months, with being an attic unheated space, those relative humidities, again, tend to remain fairly high. So you know, oftentimes what we run into in attic spaces is not necessarily that there's a lot of RH change over the seasons. Now, other people may have seen this in their own personal experience, but not necessarily a lot of RH change over the seasons, but we tend to see fairly steady high relative humidity conditions, 
which will cause mechanical damage over time, just as you know, absolutely as you're saying. Now, what can happen depending on the environment that you're in is, you, is if you have those high temperature environments during the summertime that correspond with lower relative humidities, then that's going to be exacerbated in terms of seeing that mechanical fluctuation and seeing that expansion contraction happening in terms of different hygroscopic materials. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> Lisa Rowan, uh, let's go, let's see here. Do, 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 do. All right, Lisa's asking another question. If you have the collections in a separate building where they are stored more appropriately, what happens when you take them back into the non-ideal historic structure for exhibit? Well, that's a good question, Lisa, and it's something that I think a lot of folks out there, including us, have spent a lot of time thinking about over the years. And you know what it really comes down to is thinking very carefully about what it is that you're putting on display. Uh, oftentimes what we fall back on is whenever possible try to put out facsimiles for the sake of display and especially when we're talking about different paper objects, uh, different photographs in particular, uh, it's a lot safer to try and display those copies of those facsimiles than it is to try and display the original. Now where we're dealing with things like furniture, where we're dealing with things like three-dimensional objects where not only for the sake of just how well can you get a reproduction or is it worth using the reproduction, but also for integrity's sake, you know, where you need to try and display that actual object. I think the key there is, you know, as, as always, to try and, uh, how do I want to put this, to try and reduce the amount of time that those materials are exposed to substandard preservation conditions. So if you put it out for the sake of a summer or if you put it out for a season and are able to get it back to more appropriate uh, storage conditions for the rest of the time, then that's still better than the object being in inappropriate preservation environments if that's all your building is capable of for a longer period of time. In terms of that shuffle or that move back and forth, really what you want to watch for is what are the extremes that you're dealing with. Uh, most of the time when we talk about more appropriate conditions, we're not talking about necessarily taking an object from you know, a 30% relative humidity condition and bringing it into a 65 or 70% relative humidity condition. You know, we're talking about taking an object from a 50% relative humidity condition or 55% in the appropriate storage space into a 60 or 65% relative humidity condition or potentially higher. But really it's look at what those differences are and think about what the impact is going to be typically mechanically um, on those materials as you move them from one space to another. You know, other, other problems folks might think about condensation or problems in terms of moisture uh, condensing on an object when you bring it into a space. That's only if you're taking an object out of a very cold storage environment and then, you know, let's say taking a 50 degree, uh, an object that has been equilibrated to 50 degree temperature and bringing it into a space with a 65 degree dew point. Um, that's where you're going to run into those condensation questions. But if you have, you know, if there's more information that you'd like about that, feel free to get in touch with us separately here after the webinar, and maybe we can talk about some specifics if you've had some particular issues. Uh, let's see here. We have a question coming in from Kelly Roeder, and this is a very specific one. Is this course approved by USGBC for lead credentials? Kelly, that's a Great question, and to tell you the truth, uh, we've never worked with USGBC before to try and get approval for lead credentials. Uh, we'd be happy to talk with you about that later if you're curious about that or if you think that it's something that we might look into. Um, and we'd be happy to try and support you in terms of if you're looking for uh, that credit available, we'd be happy to talk with you about that. Uh, I have one more question coming in. I'll answer this last one unless we get any others, but got a couple of minutes left. Another question uh, again from Lisa Rowan. Thanks, Lisa. Instead of using a dehumidifier, are you recommending to do conservation heating? Does that cause vapor diffusion still? Good question again. Uh, I'm not so sure it's, boy, that's a, it's really a good way of thinking about it. I think it's a matter of what do you have at your disposal? <laughs> And what is it that makes the most sense for you? If you live, I'm going to use the Pacific Northwest uh, for, an, for a good example of this, where if you're in an environment, let's say either seasonally or at different periods throughout the year, where you're working with low temperature conditions, where the building may be particularly cool, and where you're dealing with particularly high relative humidity conditions, that's one of those occasions where conservation heating makes an awful lot of sense. <clears throat> you know, 
taking what might be a building condition of 60 or 65 degrees and increasing that to 70 degrees in order to drop the relative humidity, that may very well be a better option than dehumidification, especially if it's a whole building solution as opposed to just a localized solution with a standalone dehumidifier. Now, whether or not that does cause vapor diffusion still, yes, it absolutely does. Anytime we change that vapor pressure from one side of the envelope to another, we're going to encourage vapor movement. So in any of these cases, we do just have to appreciate the fact that as we change these interior conditions, we are going to influence vapor movement across an envelope. Now, one thing that I want to be careful about is that just because vapor moves across, across an envelope doesn't necessarily mean that that's a negative process or that it's a net negative on the building. Uh, keep in mind that what we mentioned earlier, these buildings were meant to breathe and they are meant to allow moisture to go across surfaces and to dry out. So even though over time you may see, you know, let's say efflorescence or spalling that you have to be careful with, especially on masonry structures. But in older wood structures, you know, if we're looking at older wooden walls with not a lot of insulation in place, vapor movement across that structure, across that wall is actually, in terms of it not being trapped, it's a good thing. We want to make sure that it has the opportunity to go from one side to the other and to dry out so that the moisture isn't being trapped within the cavity. Um, so to answer your question, it's not necessarily recommending one over the other. It's choosing the appropriate operation for where you happen to be and what the conditions are. And the other aspect of that is understanding that, yes, diffusion will still occur, and that any time we change those conditions from the interior to the exterior, we are going to see some different rate of movement. Uh, one final question came in. This is the last one that we're going to take. Uh, the question is from Thomas Jordan. Uh, he's asking, how can I find moisture control professionals in my area? Is there a certification to look for? And asking particularly for residential and commercial construction. Well, Thomas, that's a really good question, and short answer is, is that I'm honestly not sure. Uh, most of the time, the way I go about it is try to ask some different folks that I know within the area, either in terms of different local ASHRAE chapters, if you can look it up. They may have uh, good recommendations in terms of who might be looking not only at moisture control, but also particularly an envelope specialist. Uh, there are some different folks who work with it sort of on a cultural institution basis on a broader level throughout the country. And if you're looking for some recommendations or to talk about that, feel free to get in touch and we can give you a few of those names uh, offline. We'd be happy to talk about that. But it is a good question. And oftentimes I would say, you know, start with your local ASHRAE chapter if you can find that. And also I'm not sure what the, you know, where the building envelope uh, architecture folks that would focus on that might hang out. But maybe we can look into that a little bit if you have any further questions. So sorry if that one was, wasn't much help. But uh, that's all the questions we have. That's everything that came in. I'd just like to tell everyone again, thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate your calling in and listening in for a little bit. So if you have a chance to, please do fill out the survey, and we'll see you again here in a month or so. Thanks a lot. Bye.